text this morning comes from Mark's Gospel, chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. And when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when all this will be. And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he. And they will be led away. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. But the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation, the kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and there will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The word of God for you, the people of God. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray, please. Lord, may the word from these lips and the contemplations of all our hearts be suitable to you, our Lord and our God. Amen. Add these to your list of treasures or excuses, if you will, that people have made in claims to their insurance companies. You may want to write these down so you can use them in the future. I thought my window was down, but found it was up when I put my hand through it. I collided with a stationary truck coming my way. In my attempt to kill a fly, I drove into a telephone pole. I was on my way to the doctor with rear-end trouble when my universal joint gave way, causing me to have an accident. I've been driving for 40 years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident. I kind of resemble that one. Coming home, I drove into the wrong house and collided with a tree that I didn't own. And then finally, the pedestrian had no idea which direction to run. So I ran over him. I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law, and headed over the embankment. Insurance excuses, or I mean insurance claims, they show us just how quickly life can change. And it does so without explanation or without reason, and sometimes all we can do is come up with an excuse to explain our life. Now listen to these words from our Lord again. As he was coming out of the temple one day, one of his disciples said, Lord, look how big these stones are and how huge are the buildings. And Jesus said, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be brought down. Now do you hear what he is saying? Do you really hear it? The temple was the center of Jewish life. It was at the center of the religion. It was at the center of culture. It was at the center of power and control. It was at the center of politics. And it was also the center of their economy. And he was speaking of change that was so dramatic for the Jewish people that it, if it did occur, and of course it did occur in 70 AD at the hands of the Romans, it would be breathtaking and it would be shattering. Jesus spoke about a world coming unglued. And he told them, among other things, that the Jerusalem temple would be destroyed, leveled completely. Now, imagine how hard that was to believe. It would be like somebody that's not wearing a 55-gallon wooden drum with leather suspenders naked underneath with a sign that says the world is coming to an end. But that this is the prophet of God. This is the Son of God. This is the Messiah saying these things. And understandably, those disciples were shaken to their core. And as Jesus went on to say, his disciples will be subject to every kind of pain, every kind of abuse, everything you can imagine, wars, famines, earthquakes, which have been going on since then till the day, and will go on further. In such a world, in such a world, What can anybody do? 
Well, Jesus gives his disciples something to do. He gives them a command, an imperative, if you will, in the midst of all that painful language. When the world comes apart, what should every disciple do foremost? Preach the good news. That's what he said. Preach the gospel. Preach the good news. In other words, take the preachy part out of that, live the good news. Live out the gospel in the midst of all the pain and heartache and heartbreak. What a curious thing to say. When the world is falling apart, shall we stand up and deliver a sermon? Imagine, if you will, a news show says an asteroid is about to strike Earth and there's nothing we can do. I think they made a movie about that, didn't they? Destruction is imminent. Civilized life is going to end. Meanwhile, some preacher stands up in a black Geneva gown with a green stole and starts preaching the gospel. Well, that's kind of a silly picture, isn't it? What does Jesus mean then when he says, when the world is falling apart, preach the gospel. When the world is coming apart at the seams, Live out the gospel. Live out the good news. This is a world where things fall apart. The writer of Mark's gospel knows that, and perhaps uh, more than all of the other writers in the New Testament. This is a world of disease. It's a, a world of headaches and, and hemorrhages. Uh, this is a world that reminds us of, of human weakness where things that are good can go bad, that there are nothing that is perfect. It's a world that reminds us of our, our, our deafness and our blindness, our paralysis. And ultimately, it reminds us that we all have a debt to pay called death. This is a world of chaos and cruelty where... Good things happen to bad people. Where bad things happen to good people. Where deception and meanness is rampant. Where people put spin on the truth and do what they do to put themselves in powerful positions to control other people's lives. In the words of a favorite hymn of the church, though, that mirrored the words of Mark, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear. For God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. Preach the gospel, live the gospel. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. One little word shall fell him. Have you ever noticed just how quickly people's lives can turn upside down? Have you ever had that to happen to you? You know, you're going along a path and you think everything's fine. It's, it's not perfect, but it's okay. And then all of a sudden, the world just goes upside down. You didn't see the speed bump. You didn't see the pothole. You didn't see the oncoming car or the uh, curve. Yeah. Up until December the 4th, 2002, Robert McAnellis in um, San Antonio, Texas, thought he was doing all the right things. And when he arrived at work that morning, the boss just out of the blue fired him. And his, his wife was across the street in, a, in an office, so he walks across there and tells her what has happened. And as he's leaving that office building he's walking around a corner and a building the whole building falls in on top of him and when the rescuers the first responders get there they only find his feet sticking out from under the rubble but when they dig he's in a in a like a little cave in the rubble and they pull him out and freed him um, and Robert told his mother in his uh, in his room 
uh, that he was going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay. Now, obviously, the twin catastrophes that occurred to him is not likely going to happen to any of us anyway. Yet sometimes it may feel like they have. You know, we not only had one catastrophe, but we had a second catastrophe and then a third catastrophe. You know, I'm a pilot, and usually when there's an air crash, it's a series of issues that they did not make proper correction. You know, one thing led to another that leads to another that leads to another. And that's often like life, isn't it? It's a series of things that take us down that dark path. You know, life can be cruel to us, and it can happen to in a few breathtaking moments. Things we have taken for granted, a happy old age, health, you know, money in the bank, you know, a, a nice house, uh, on and on and on, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden we have Hurricane Florence. All of a sudden we have Hurricane Hugo or Matthew. All of a sudden there's a fire. All of a sudden. All of a sudden, the temple falls. It's like something that happened to Lieutenant Colonel William Rankin. And the year was in 1959, and he was flying over Virginia uh, in his single-engine plane, and he got caught in a storm. And he realized that the, 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 plane could j- the power of the plane could not overcome the, the, the thrust of the, of the storm around him. So he actually bailed out of this single-engine plane. And uh, on the way down, he let his parachute out and wind caught it. And it took him on an hour-and-a-half ride in his parachute. And he actually landed in New Jersey. Can you imagine that? Mm. What a ride. Well, what do you do when life tosses us about like that? What do we do when life takes us on a parachute ride like that? Because sooner or later, either it has or it's going to. Listen to the words of Jesus again. Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Do you see those, that great building? Not one stone is going to be left upon another. They were stunned, and they were shook. Uh, You know, it'd be like Jesus standing in that harbor on December the 5th and saying, you see all those ships out there in Battleship Row? Most of them are going to get sunk. It would be like Jesus standing in front of the Twin Towers on September 11th. And saying, you see these things? The center of your economy, the center of your pride? They're going to come down. Jesus was taking those disciples to a place spiritually that Stephen Covey tried to take us systemically in our task-oriented lives. You remember the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? You remember that book? Well, he also talks about effective people begin with the end in mind. You project where you want to go, what you want to do, or where you want to arrive, and then you work back from there with your plans. The end in mind. Then he, he, even Covey spun it just a little bit. You begin with your life. What do you want people to say about you at the end game when when they're standing around your grave and they're doing that little funeral around your grave? What do you want them to say about you? What do you want them to put on your tombstone? Maybe it was a grump? Hmm? She lied, she cheated, she stole, she was a gossiper. Do you want all that stuff on your tombstone? What do you want them to say about you? No, she was loving. He was kind. He was generous. He was hope-filled. Beginning with the end in mind. Were we truthful and honest? Were we trustworthy, moral, ethical? And I'd add to that, if you will, did they live as a child of God? Did they live 
as a child of God. Uh, there's an end to everything. The Bible tells us that for each of us, there is that reckoning. And we should live with that end in mind. Not no morbidity, but live with that end in mind. Life is a school for souls. Some people didn't go to a college. But they went to the University of Hard Knocks. And that's called life itself. And through those knocks of that university, we become stronger, we become wiser, we become more resolved, if you will. As Walter Brueggemann, one of my favorite theologians, notes, for all our intellectual sophistication, seemingly assured affluence and confidence in our technology, thick, unsettled feeling that things are indeed falling apart cuts across the spectrum. Our best institutions have become oddly dysfunctional. Churches are on survival mode. Courts are only sometimes yielding out justice. Medication, uh, medical institutions provide sporadic access. Schools just occasionally educate. And all our institutions seem in a deep crisis of purpose. What do you do? What do you and I do? Live out the gospel. Be the gospel. It's like a story that Mary Hollingsworth tells. It's about the noted director, Cecil B. DeMille, and he was making the uh, um, Ben-Hur film. And, of course, Charlton Heston was the, the star of that movie. And there was uh, the great chariot scene in the movie. And... Heston realized that that was the most significant scene of the entire film, and he and DeMille began talking about that. DeMille told Heston, uh, you probably need to get chariot race uh, experience because we're not going to use a double. You're going to have to do your own race scenes. So Heston, for days and weeks, began racing uh, a chariot. And after weeks, he goes back to the director and he says, you know, uh, Mr. DeMille, uh, I think I can uh, race a chariot now, but I don't think I can win. And DeMille said, that's okay, Heston. You just stay in the race. I'll make sure you win. We don't have to dread. We don't have to fear and worry. Read about the last inning, the final few seconds of the last quarter, or the final scene of the last act of humanity called the revelation. God will win. All we have to do is stay in the race. Stay in the race. Live out the gospel. All you have to do by the grace of God is continue. And God will make us winners in the end. I like a story that someone tells about a young lady by the name of Sally. Uh, she was growing up, becoming a woman, and preparing to go off to college. And her mother had struggled to provide her an education, a decent place to live, and, and you know, decent clothes. And it was difficult because her husband had died when Sally was very young. Um, her mother made every effort within her, her power to raise Sally right, and um, now she was going to go off on her own. So Sally had some strong reservations about leaving her mother alone to mind the farm and all the chores that come along with living on a farm. She also was nervous about having to find her own way without her mother giving her some guidance along the way. And as she prepared to meet the bus, bags packed, standing out there beside the road, the mother and the daughter began to converse. And her mother took her by the arm and told her, you're going to see things and do things you ain't never heard or done before. And you won't know which way to turn sometimes. 
You remember how you used to tug on my apron string when you wanted something and I'd see to what you were, I would see to what you were after? You remember how you were too close to the road and I'd holler for you to get away from there? Her mother gently reminded, well, I'm going to be there with you in your heart. But I'll be up, it'll be up to you to listen to what I tell you. I can't kiss your hurts when you fall down, skin or skin your knee, or, or, or quiet you when the big storms roll through your life. But I'll be close as a peanut in your pocket when you need me. If you're afraid, I'll stand with you. And if you're hurting, you can feel me close. And if you do wrong, I'll whisper the truth to you so you won't do it anymore. Of course, the tears from four eyes began to flow. And her mother opened the dress of her, her pocket and pulled out a napkin. And it was knotted on one end. And it was like it used to be when she gave her child money to go to the store to buy something, she would put the change in the napkin and tie it and give it to her daughter. And she handed that little napkin to her daughter. And they kissed. The bus pulls up, they kiss, and Sally gets on the bus and she sits down and she begins to think about the conversation and she sticks her hand in her pocket and she finds the napkin. And she pulls it out and of course it has the little knot on the top. And she undoes it and in the center of the napkin is a peanut. A peanut. She knew that her mother would always be there with her in her heart. And that's the good news for us today. When our lives feel as though they are falling apart and temples are falling and temples are failing, God is with us every step of the way. Beginning with the end in mind reminds us that everything matters. We are conditioning our hearts for eternity. But, as, but that's also why everything's all right. Because our hearts don't belong to us. Our hearts belong to God. We don't have to perfect our hearts. Only hearts with God's love in them will become perfect. God will do the perfecting. And one day we know we'll be entirely in God's presence. And that is why life is good. Regardless of how the world may appear or seem. Not one stone left upon another. And it happened just that way. All was gone. And it reminds us to put your, our heart and our soul and our mind not into what is physical today, but what is eternal tomorrow. All else one day will be gone. Everything, everything. Everything. But God, put your soul in his hand and be a winner. Amen.